Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, start up, uh, looks like we got most of the people back in the room, and uh, jump right into CUDA. And I just want to uh, emphasize, I uh, noticed the last time around most people waited to the end to ask their questions, which is very nice, but please don't, don't hold back if uh, there's something that's, that's bothering you as I'm talking about uh, some aspect of CUDA. Speak right up and, and uh, raise your hand and we'll, we'll deal with the question then so you don't uh, sit there wondering for the rest of the talk. So uh, <clears throat> we're going to go over the, the programming model and uh, talk about uh, the basic concepts and, and uh, data types that are necessary. Uh, the, uh, as we've, we've uh, uh, answered a couple of times, so we have uh, a few API um, uh, pieces that we had to add, uh, but they're pretty basic. And uh, we'll use some simple examples to illustrate uh, how to get started and, and the things you need to do to write a CUDA program. And what we're going to uh, do for this introduction is we'll pretty much ignore performance and efficiency. Uh, uh, as when we do, this will be parallel programming without the performance, uh, just so you can learn the, uh, the structure and how to, how to build the program. And then uh, we'll go through the process of how you add the performance incrementally later. So, um, so you saw this, this slide um, <clears throat> in the last section. And really, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, how you take a C program and you decompose it into the, uh, the serial pieces or modestly parallel, only slightly parallel pieces. And we'll, we'll keep those pieces running on the host, or uh, typically the CPU. And uh, the pieces that are highly parallel, highly data parallel, or highly uh, execution parallel, those will run on what we call the device, which is typically the GPU. Uh, and that will be a small amount, usually, of, of uh, kernel code, which gets replicated many, many times. So, uh, so we'll use the term uh, device to, to describe the, uh, the GPU. Uh, when we begin to have CUDA execution on multi-core CPUs, device is not always a GPU. Sometimes it will be a multi-core CPU. So we talk about the host as the control processor and the device as the execution processor. And um, in our model of the world, uh, the device is a, a coprocessor to the host. It doesn't operate fully independently. Uh, they operate in, in lockstep, uh, uh, trading execution uh, threads back and forth. Uh, but the, the device does have its own uh, local DRAM, uh, typically uh, with the, the uh, uh, GeForce 8, uh, the G80 processor. You have um, three quarters of a gigabyte of memory. And the, the newer processors, we have up to four gigabytes of, of DRAM uh, at very high bandwidth. Uh, the device runs many, many uh, threads in parallel. Uh, typically, uh, to saturate the machine, you'll need tens of thousands of threads of execution running at the same time. And uh, most often, you should think about it in terms of it being a GPU, but of course, it can be another kind of device, such as a multi-core CPU. And uh, <clears throat> the data parallel pieces of your application, you will express those <coughs> as device kernels, a small chunk of code, which is going to run in many instances. And uh, if you've done a lot of parallel programming before, as I'm talking about thousands and thousands of threads, it might be uh, seeming like that's kind of uh, scary. And um, if, you, if you visualize running thousands of threads on a CPU, uh, you're, you're visualizing a very ugly picture. And uh, GPU threads, uh, in this case, are, are a very different kind of thread. Uh, very, very lightweight. Uh, all of the state is managed in hardware. Uh, there's very little creation overhead. In fact, uh, you can uh, create a thread in, in a single cycle, a group of threads in a single cycle, because the hardware does everything. And also, uh, when we're running these tens of thousands of threads on hundreds of processors, in order to run efficiently, we're doing lots of context switching between those threads. They're all executing in an interleaved fashion. And hardware is handling that for you as well, completely transparently. And all of the context switching between threads is done uh, completely in hardware. It would take zero cycles, actually, to switch between threads. You can run any active thread in any cycle with, with zero overhead. And <clears throat> because of this structure, uh, we're optimized to run many threads. And in fact, you need many threads for full efficiency. We rely on, on the fact that you have many threads to hide memory latency, to hide pipeline depth and pipeline latency. So we optimize our processor for different things than, than a CPU. And uh, in fact, the same things that we, we optimize with many tens of threads per core, uh, you only need a couple of threads to optimize those same things on a, on a CPU. But <clears throat> you actually not only do you only need a couple on a CPU, you can't run a lot of threads. If you, if you had 1,000 threads on a CPU, you would spend all of your time context switching because it's all done in software. Whereas with the, the hardware model on the GPU, uh, the context switching is free, so you don't spend any time doing it. So uh, this is a block diagram of a, of a modern GPU. And uh, this is uh, G80, the GeForce uh, 8000 series product that shipped um, almost two years ago now. And, um, this is the, the graphics personality, the graphics mode of the hardware. If you're, uh, if you're running a graphics API, when you, uh, when you run a program, uh, you still have a host, you have a CPU, and it sends a sequence of commands uh, uh, driven by uh, API calls and uh, uh, collects together uh, the, the inputs to draw a triangle. It sends vertices to be processed in the, in the array of cores. It also can do uh, geometry mesh processing and also can do uh, pixel processing. And uh, all of this, uh, all the actual computation is aliased onto this uh, C of processor cores. Each one of these little green boxes is a scalar processor core. And so in G80, there's 128 of those. Uh, there is special hardware for uh, texture fetching, because in graphics, the process of reading from a texture and filtering values is a very important uh, interloop kind of calculation. So there's special hardware support for it. And uh, although in the programming model for GPU, we're fond of saying there's no caches, there's a very limited amount of caching, but it's completely stream-based. It's completely uh, for, for uh, hiding memory latency and, uh, and providing fan out to the many pixels that are being uh, processed in parallel. Uh, there's almost no reuse in the caches. So if you think of it in terms of a CPU, cache this doesn't do the same things for you it does a completely different set of things but the important thing to take home from this uh, as you're thinking about using the GPU for computing is that the graphics architecture has evolved to the point where most of the chip is this array of processors and then there's just a bunch of glue around it that imposes the graphic semantics on the array of processing cores when you switch to the um, the computing personality of, uh, of G80 the CUDA mode we <coughs> we shed all of the, the graphic semantics and we have a uh, simpler structure that allows you to basically load and run programs and much of the uh, graphics pieces that are uh, attached to the cores are, are deprecated away, uh, but all of the uh, pieces that are used for managing throughput of data uh, are, are now used for sharing data. They're effectively shared registers for all the processor cores that you're running with. And one piece of the graphics semantics that we retain in CUDA mode, because it's really useful as a general computing construct, is the texture unit. And I'll talk a bit more about that later, but if you're uh, 
addressing data from an array, 1D, 2D, or 3D, and you want to sample or filter the data, there's a bunch of hardware that does that for graphics, and you can make use of that hardware as a primitive, rather than doing multiply adds to filter something together and doing all the address calculations, the hardware can just hide that for you. So when you're uh, processing grids of data, uh, using the texture hardware is a very valuable acceleration mechanism. But again, the point here is that the most of the chip is actually in use when you're doing uh, CUDA mode, because you're using the processor cores. So, um, so CUDA is, uh, is a, a minimal extension from C, and I say minimal extension not, not because it is as, as small as, as it could possibly be, but it's, it's as, as minimal as we could reasonably make it, and, and no, no simpler than that. Uh, so some of the things that we had to, to add are uh, some decal specs so that you could describe where things live and where things are accessible. So uh, if you have something that is an entry point on the GPU, that's global. If you have uh, a uh, piece of data that is, uh, uh, sorry, a, a routine that is on the GPU, that, that is a device routine. And uh, we identify these uh, with the uh, double leading and, and trailing underscore. Um, you also can specify whether data is shared between multiple threads or whether it is local to single thread. And there's a specific memory, specific hardware that is used for, for shared data, and it has a limited size, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, <clears throat> when you have many, many threads running, and our threads are grouped into groups we call blocks. Each thread needs to know which thread it is within the group and which group it's part of uh, so that you can collaboratively use the different threads to process a lot of data to solve a bigger problem. Uh, and those are um, intrinsics that are provided by the hardware. Uh, you also have the ability to synchronize between multiple threads, and there are also atomic operations uh, for communicating between threads, and those are hardware operations. And uh, finally, there is an API in the runtime that allows you to do such things as uh, um, managing memory, copying data back and forth, uh, managing the execution uh, to launch a bunch of threads or to control the sequence of, of, of operations. And finally, uh, when you launch a set of threads on the GPU, uh, we have uh, syntax that, that allows you to specify that, how many, how many threads and how many groups of threads, and then the hardware will, will create the context and launch all of those threads in parallel so that you can run your program. So uh, the way to, to think of a CUDA computation is uh, if you're running efficiently on the GPU, you are running uh, many arrays of parallel threads. And in this example, I'm just going to use eight. But uh, typically, you will be, run, excuse me, you'll be running many thousands if you're saturating the machine. And uh, the way that this works is uh, you write a, a piece of kernel code, a single piece of C, single piece of C code. And the same piece of C code is, is executed by, by a large array of threads. And uh, it's SPMD, single program, multiple data. And uh, each thread has this thread ID that I talked about that it uses to compute unique memory addresses and make unique control decisions. So for example, in, in, uh, in this case, with these eight threads, uh, each thread, the first thing it's going to do is read an input based on its unique ID. So each one is reading a different piece of input. Even though the code is the same, it's accessing a different address. It performs some operation on the data, and then it writes the output to a location that is indexed by the thread ID. So this same program running across a large array of threads is going to collectively read a bunch of inputs, do operations locally and write out a bunch of outputs. And it's running completely lockstep uh, as if it's a MIMD execution. I'm sorry, as if it's MIMD, but it's fully MIMD operation. So uh, <clears throat> as you group these threads together, uh, oh, I have a question here. Uh, the question is, when you, when you launch a, a kernel on the GPU, is the CPU blocked? No, it is not. It can, <laughs> it can asynchronously go do other things. Right. By default, if you just, uh, we have two, two versions of the API. One, one is blocking, and we have another set of calls that you can make that are not blocking. Uh, and you know, it's for, uh, for advanced users only. You know, it's the don't try this at home unless you know what you're doing. Uh, because a lot of people are, are using the asynchronous uh, one to double buffer data and double buffer uh, uh, loading and unloading. And, and you, you need to know that that's what you're doing so that you don't stop on your data. Uh. The question is, uh, single program, multiple data, how is that different than uh, single instruction, multiple data? Uh, well, this is a whole can of worms uh, from that question. And actually, I'll give you the, I'll give you the punchline, which uh, uh, we'll talk about more over time. And I, I can't quite answer that that quickly. The, this hardware is, is SIMT, single instruction, multiple thread. And uh, SPMD is, uh, from my understanding, it's a programming style. You're writing a program which is going to run in many instances. SIMD is an execution style. You're, you're writing a program, and, and you're collectively executing clumps of things. And <coughs> MIMD, as you know, is independent threads with independent data. And um, <coughs> what SIMT adds to that is the ability to share data and run in an optimized fashion when the task can be executed in a SIMD fashion. But when there is divergence, we can gradually degrade performance, gradually stop sharing resources, and approach a fully MIMD, fully independent threaded model. You could write a program that immediately does a 10,000-way branch on all the different threads, and every thread does something completely different very, very slowly. <laughs> but you can write any program, and it will run. It will, it will run correctly. But the, the SPMD is, the, is describing the, the way that you think of writing your program. You, you write a program which gets executed in many instances. So uh, uh, you have an array of threads, and uh, each, uh, each set of threads um, a very large number of threads is uh, subdivided into a smaller organization, which we call thread blocks. Uh, so there's two levels of hierarchy. There's threads in a block, and then there's blocks in the, the overall kernel that's being executed. And uh, one of the characteristics of a thread block is uh, all the threads in a block execute locally close to each other on the machine. They, run, they execute on the same subgroup of processors. And why that is significant is that threads within a block can cooperate with each other. They can communicate. They can synchronize with the barrier, the sync threads that I mentioned on a couple slides ago. They can share data by shared memory. They can write the shared registers and read to exchange information. And uh, when you have atomic operations, they operate within a block as well. And uh, threads in different blocks cannot cooperate with each other because they are potentially very far from each other physically on the chip, or maybe on a different chip, or maybe in a different time. You can describe a kernel with thousands of blocks with hundreds of threads per block, so a very large number of threads. And in fact, more threads than can run in the machine at, at one time. And the hardware will schedule a block at a time or two blocks at a time or however many it can do and sequence through the blocks. So I'll get to your question in just a second. Uh, so when you're running a block, if you wanted to communicate with a different block, uh, that different block may not run for another week. 
It may not even be loaded in the machine yet. So the locality of communication is at the block level. And this also is one of the characteristics that enables scalability. So we could build a machine that can run one block at a time, and we can also build a machine that could run thousands of blocks at a time. And the hardware manages the scheduling so that you can scale from a very small CUDA processor to a very large CUDA processor, and the code runs exactly the same. Okay, now the question. Well, the Yeah, so the question is, different blocks may execute at different times, but within a block, do all the threads execute at the same time? Uh, yes, uh, with the, the caveat that not every thread in the block executes every cycle, but they all are executing as a group. So we, uh, we kind of jokingly refer to blocks as roving gangs of threads. You know, they travel together, but they don't, they don't all do the same thing at exactly the same time. So the question is, is the um, size of the block uh, uh, specified? And the answer is yes. The programmer specifies the size of the block. And we'll talk more about how you make a good choice for block size, because uh, it's, it's a parameter that uh, you, will, you will vary. In fact, it's something also uh, that um, some people have done some work looking at auto-tuning. And uh, some one-way students have looked at how do you automatically choose the block size, uh, rather than making that the responsibility of the programmer. Okay, so, so this is a really key concept, and this multi-level, uh, multi-scale of parallelism is, is a critical component of both the scalability and also the very high performance communication between threads. It's a, it's a mechanism that allows us to have a lot of hardware locality, but also the ability to scale up to enormous numbers of, of parallelism. So, uh, so here's a, a pictorial uh, representation of that with a little more detail. Uh, as I mentioned, each thread uses the IDs, the thread ID and the block ID, to decide which data to work on, and also to decide which part of the problem it's working on if, if a bunch of threads are collaborating on a problem. And um, <coughs> a, a block, uh, blocks have a dimensionality of one or two. So you could have a linear array of blocks, or you could have a uh, rectangular array of blocks. And then you have a, a 1D or a two-dimensional ID. So there's a structure. You have block ID.x and block ID.y. Uh, for within a block, you can have one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or, or three-dimensional array of threads. And likewise, there's a thread ID then would have one dimension, uh, two dimension, or threes, x, y, and z, or one, two, and three. And uh, really, in the hardware, just like in uh, the hardware when you have a C array of data, it's all one-dimensional. It's a linear structure of data. But uh, the hardware has the capability of doing this addressing arithmetic for you. So if your data for the problem you're trying to solve is an image, you probably have all of your data organized in two dimensions, so it's easier for you to write a program that thinks of it as a 2D array of, of work to be done. Or if you're doing uh, you know, 3D uh, differential equation solving or uh, 3D like, uh, uh, imaging volume data, you might have three-dimensional organization of your data, and so you want to organize your threads in that same way so that the hardware will, will help you with the addressing and help you with the uh, stepping through the data. It's really just a convenience for, for the programming. It's not configurable. Um, it's, it's, uh, I always forget which is, which is what it is. It's the, C, it's the C organization, so that would be uh, row, row major. Yeah. When you say row major or column major, I think it's the, the rows are bigger or the rows are more important, which is it. <laughs> okay, so uh, the memory model for CUDA, uh, this is not uh, quite the same as a, uh, as a CPU in terms of the resources that each processing core has. There's a little extra capability. Okay, so uh, I'll just go ahead and announce this now. Uh, I believe that the slides are now available online, uh, and uh, so you should be able to access them uh, for the remote people. Uh, so sorry for, for the delay in that. <clears throat> but I'm sure you guys will all catch up in moments. Uh, uh, yes, I think that, that these are the slides that are available online. Yeah, yes. Okay, so on the agenda page online, under the title of each element is the, uh, are the slides for that session. Okay, so the, uh, the GPU hardware has some uh, special memory constructs that, that uh, support the kinds of calculations that we've been talking about. And um, <clears throat> it uh, allows you to do uh, things like communicating data between the host and the device. And uh, also, uh, there's different kinds of memory that are used for communicating between threads on the device and, and uh, different kinds of memory that are used for the calculation within a thread on the device. Um, the, the global memory is the external DRAM on the, the uh, GPU card, and uh, it is uh, readable and writable by both the host and by device threads. And uh, it's, uh, it's called global because it's visible globally. All threads can see it. And it's very long latency access. So uh, because it's off-chip and because we don't have a lot of uh, caching in our memory hierarchy, as you're running a thread program, when you do a read from the global memory, uh, it takes a long time for that data to return. That's one of the reasons we have so many threads, because each thread can do something while one of the threads is waiting for the data to return from a, from a long latency read. There was a question back there. Uh, Years. <laughs> uh, arbitrarily long, actually. So it's, it's at least hundreds, but arbitrarily long uh, because it's scheduled, a read is scheduled against other, uh, other resource demands on the DRAM. So you know, let's say if you have multiple, multiple CPU cores reading and writing data to the global memory and you have threads reading and writing data. Oh, and by the way, also interleaved with your CUDA program, you're running a graphics program and, <coughs> and you're playing Doom at the same time. And, uh, your particular read request may get scheduled behind a whole bunch of other stuff. That's right. It's always runs at, Doom always runs at a higher priority. <laughs> so uh, there's another question up front. Does any time the kernel run? So, so the kernel doesn't, like, when you call a kernel from a CUDA program, it doesn't necessarily flush into this memory or do anything to it. So the question is, when you, um, when you call, call a kernel, it doesn't necessarily flush the memory. But, but when you call the kernel, it's just like load and run. It just loads your uh, C code and, and runs it. It doesn't necessarily do anything to the memory. And uh, typically what you will have done is your host program set up the global memory that, that your kernel is going to use. You launch the kernel and it runs, expecting the data to all be there. And when it's done, it writes its results all out to global memory. Then you return to your host program, which will then read the results back from the global memory. So, uh, so we'll focus on, on this memory space for a while and, until you're uh, really comfortable with it. And then we'll throw you some curveballs and add some other ones. Uh, so the, 
the highlights of the, the CUDA API, uh, the, the overriding design concerns were to make it easy to learn and make it very lightweight for execution. So uh, we really did think about inventing an all new language, and uh, some people really wanted to, but uh, we decided that it was not necessary. And uh, we really have embraced the, the religion of uh, trying to keep things as, as simple as possible and, and stay as close to the standards as we can. So, so really built very firmly on NCC. <coughs> so if, uh, for experienced C programmers, it's a, it's a very low learning curve, not very steep at all to start writing the first CUDA programs. And uh, the hardware is designed to, uh, to automatically execute in hardware as many of the housekeeping and management tasks as possible so that the runtime and the driver can be very lightweight. There's very little overhead. That's why uh, tasks such as thread scheduling, thread creation, and resource management are largely done by the hardware in very simple and straightforward ways. And so we can make very lightweight kind of uh, thread constructs so that they can be completely managed by the hardware. That's what enables us to get high performance execution with 10,000 threads. So, uh, when you're, uh, when you're running your program, uh, just like a C program on a, on a uniprocessor or a multi-core CPU, you, uh, you allocate your memory with, with malloc, and we have CUDA malloc allows you to allocate uh, memory in the, in the global memory, in the DRAM on the, on the GPU card, and um, you have two parameters, address and size. Um, <coughs> you, uh, you also then, when you're done, uh, since you're a good programmer, you free the memory, you don't, don't leave it all lying around, uh, and that just requires a pointer to the object. Uh, so just as a simple example, uh, very straightforward, just like uh, malloc uh, in C on a CPU, you, you want to... Uh, Pick the size that you're going to allocate, and you uh, then uh, define your variable, and then you do the, the malloc of the size, and then when you're done with your calculation, you do the free. Yes. So CUDA could, malloc could is is just uh, giving you the, the pointer to the to the address in the. Uh, you give it a place to store the pointer. Uh, if you are exiting the program, just like with a C program, everything should get cleaned up. So, uh, so yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. If you don't free, are you going to get? Is there going to be stuff left lying around? Uh, certainly during the program, if you don't free, you're, you're going to have, have problems. But once you exit, uh, the runtime should, should free all the resources. If it doesn't, that's a bug. Yeah. By the way, I still think there are at least one or two more bugs. In the <laughs> <laughs> so if you find them, uh, please file bug reports and help us make it better. <clears throat> so uh, once you've allocated your memory space, you, you want to transfer your data from, from the host to the device. So uh, you do uh, CUDA memcopy. Again, uh, you'll notice the similarity with, with memcopy. And uh, the only, only difference is uh, that we have to specify the memory spaces. So you have the pointer from the, from the source, the pointer to the destination, the amount of bytes that you want to copy. And there's a enumerated type that uh, gives you the uh, where to where parameter. So is it from the CPU to the GPU or the GPU back to the CPU? Um, and this uh, transfer is, is asynchronous. You do the call, and it returns, and the transfer happens behind your back. So uh, again, uh, <coughs> you want to uh, transfer uh, an array of data, and your m is in your host memory, and md is in your device memory. This is, by the way, uh, not required, but it's a really convenient convention to, to uh, label things that way so you can always remember where they are. Uh, since you have multiple memory spaces, it's a, it's a unique thing that we've added that is easy, easy to get yourself wrapped around the axle with uh, having uh, referring to, to uh, memory pointers in the wrong address space. They don't have any meaning. So when you are doing an asynchronous copy, the, um, the execution of the launch of your, your code is, uh, is synchronous and in blocks. So uh, if you want to do asynchronous execution after you've, you've done that, you need to use a different API for, for doing the, the launch. We'll get, we'll get to, to the, the how to build asynchronous. The, the way the API is built is if you don't worry about it, everything will be fine. If you, <laughs> if you start doing clever things to make your program overlap in asynchronous, you need to have done the right things in the right order. Uh, the question was, uh, after the um, CUDA malloc returns the pointer, can you just do math on it and, and read and write stuff directly? And the answer is no. You don't have direct access to the, to the CUDA memory space. You have to use the memcopy to, to read and write data. So. CUDA, CUDA malloc allocates space in the device memory. Yeah. Yes. You need to do a malloc on the host side, CUDA malloc on the device side, and a CUDA memcopy to copy from the host to the, to the device. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to make an editorial comment about the other question and answer is, uh, in, a, in a parallel world, doing pointer arithmetic on addresses and reaching under the hood and copying stuff around is bad behavior anyway. You're gonna, <laughs> even if it's not CUDA, you're going to hurt yourself sooner or later doing that. Just a, just a personal opinion. Yeah, so um, the question was uh, hooking into GDB and uh, the experiences with a lot of threads. Debugging is really painful. Um, and uh, well, it's true. Debugging with a lot of threads is, is complex at, at best, painful at worst. Uh, we do have our own tools. Uh, we have visualization uh, tools for debugging and profiling, uh, which are much more mature on the Windows side with, with the Visual Studio. And uh, it is, I would uh, say, an, an open research problem how to visualize the behavior of 10,000 threads. And uh, we've, we've uh, developed a few ways, and it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Typically, what people do is they do their debugging with a smaller number of threads and get it, get it uh, close. Because uh, you, can't, you can't use printouts and all those other things either. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about that later. Uh, you can run in emulation mode where everything just runs on the CPU, and then you can single step and, and, uh, and run through that way. But it is, it is a complex process. Uh, so, uh, so you have your array on the host side, and you have your uh, array space on the, on the device side, and you want to copy uh, from the uh, host to the device using CUDA memcopy host to device, which is just a symbolic constant that spells out what's happening. And after you're done, uh, all, of, all of your computing was in there somewhere. Uh, after you're done, you, you copy it back to, to recover the data back onto the host. Okay. 
So uh, let's see, do we, do we transition? Okay, this is where we transition. So, uh, <coughs> so I'm gonna hand this over to Lene to, to talk about the rest. Okay, so um, David mentioned that um, CUDA is really just a minimal expansion to C, and um, uh, a lot of the expansion were in the API functions, such as the um, memory allocation and data transfer that David just talked about. But there are um, a whole uh, set of keywords that you know, you're gonna be, need to use in order to declare functions and declare data types. So uh, these are the things I'm gonna talk about. So um, you know, by this time, you should be wondering, right? So you know, CUDA is gonna define some of the functions to run on the CPUs, and then some of the functions will be running on the GPU. So how, how does it know which one runs where? And that's done through the uh, keywords. So if you put a underscore, underscore, those, the underscore is actually two of them together. Okay, so underscore, underscore, device, underscore, underscore, that means that this function is gonna be run on the GPU. And um, it, so if you put a underscore underscore host underscore underscore in front of a function, that means it's going to be run on the CPU. If you don't put anything in front of the function, it's going to be run on the CPU. So you don't need to have a host as well as uh, a host in front of the function. So now you ask me why you will want to have underscore underscore host. It's a situation where if you have a function that you want to run both on the CPU and the GPU, then you have both this host and device keywords in front of it. Okay, that guarantees that it's going to generate two versions of the function. One version will run on the CPU, one version will run on the, on the GPU. Make sense so far? And the reason why host is optional is that a lot of you will be probably porting programs from CPU to the CPU GPU heterogeneous execution. So you may start with a lot of functions that you already have on the CPU and this allows you not to have to go back and add underscore underscore host in front of every function. If you don't have anything in front of it, it's automatically just running on the CPU. Um, this global thing here in the middle, this is very important. Underscore underscore global means that the function is a kernel function. And that's the beginning point of parallel execution. If you have a function that is declared as underscore underscore global underscore underscore, that means the function is gonna be called from the CPU. Okay, so the CPU will launch that kernel but the kernel is gonna be executed on the GPU. So this is kind of a gateway thing, right? So you, this is how you enter parallel execution. And this, that's why we have these two columns by now, it should make perfect sense. You know, there's one column that tells you where the function is gonna be executed, and the other one tells you where the function is gonna be called. And you know, for the device functions, you know, they will execute it on the device and they will be called by other device functions. The only function that can be executed on the device and called by the, from the CPU or the host is the, uh, the, the kernel functions. <coughs> so, um, you know what, one of the uh, limitations that you have to remember is uh, device functions cannot have their addresses taken. So if you declare a function to, you know, to, to run on the, on the device or the GPU, you cannot call these functions to pointers. And um, these, you know, for the functions that, aren't, that execute on the device, you also want to make sure that they're not recursive. So you, you don't want to run, you know, call some kind of Fibonacci, uh, Fibonacci, Fibonacci uh, function in a recursive way. And you don't want to do static variable declarations inside the function, and you don't want to have variable number of arguments. All these may change in the future, but these are the limitations that allow the underlying implementation to fully inline all the device functions into the kernel. So in the current generation implementation, a kernel function may be calling all these other fun device functions, but those functions will be fully inlined into the kernel, and they are, it's going to be, you know, the parallel execution is going to be fully crafted in that single uh, source code. And in the future implementation, these things may be, you know, limitations may be, uh, may be eliminated because the implementation may no longer require full inlining of these uh, functions. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the kernel functions. Okay, the, again, the kernel functions are the, the most important uh, functions that uh, you're going to be dealing with. And all these functions need to be called with execution configuration. Someone asked you know, whether the, the block size is going to be specified by the programmer or under the hood. And this is exactly where it's uh, specified, by the programmer. So uh, the, the slide shows a simple example of a uh, kernel call. So uh, the first line, underscore, underscore, uh, you know, global, da, 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 is the declaration of that fun uh, the kernel function. So before you launch a kernel, you need to set up at least two of the parameters, uh, the configuration parameters. One is the grid, dimension of grids. And remember, each grid is a two-dimensional, two up to two-dimensional structure. So David mentioned that you could use a linear dimension that is you know, just one dimension of blocks, or you could have two-dimensional uh, blocks. And so in this example, we're using a two-dimensional uh, grid. And that means that the grid will have 100 blocks in one dimension and 50 blocks in another dimension. That totals 5,000, okay, 5,000 blocks in the grid. And within, the, uh, within each block, the threads are organized into a three-dimensional uh, structure here. It's a four by eight by eight uh, three-dimensional structure. There's an optional uh, parameter, which is the shared memory size, and we're not gonna talk about shared memory for now. So I'm gonna just you know, put it as a, a placeholder, and we're gonna come back to that tomorrow morning. So when we launch the kernel, it's just like a function call. It's very much like a function call from the CPU code. But before the parameters of that function, there's a, you know, there's a special symbol, three lower than, uh, less than signs, followed by the, the configuration parameters and three greater than signs. These are the special markers that tell the CUDA runtime that here are the configuration parameters that define the dimensions and the size of dimensions of all the blocks and the, uh, the threads within the blocks. Okay, so this is where the, uh, the CUDA runtime receives the specification of the exact thread organization of your parallel execution. These things don't have to be constants. They can be calculated variables, but they need to be determined before the execution of the, uh, of, of the kernel, okay? Any cost to the kernel function is asynchronous from CUDA 1.0 on. So what that means is the CPU will actually continue to execute as a default. So if you want the CPU to wait, you need to put in that uh, synchronous call and synchronize things. And in the lab, tomorrow afternoon, uh, we're going to actually give you some sample code and you're going to see the, the exact syntax of these you know, synchronization calls and so on. John, right? we, uh, John, we're going to have those code examples tomorrow afternoon, right? Okay. So uh, we're gonna, I'm going to take you through a very simple example, which is matrix multiplication. And you know, uh, I assume that you know, with the science and you know, engineering uh, you know, uh, experts here, you know, everyone should know matrix multiplication. And um, you know, it, it's a very, very simple example in the sense that we're going to leave shared memory usage until tomorrow, after, uh, tomorrow morning. Um, we're going to use uh, registers. And it, it's going to be very easy and very visible. Um, you know, uh, I'll point out you know, when it's going to be using uh, registers and uh, thread ID usage. You know, David talked about thread ID and block, uh, thre thread index and block index. And we're going to see exactly how these things are used. And we're going to be talking about memory data transfer again. But you know, this time it's in action. And we assume uh, square matrix for simplicity. But just a quick you know, review of matrix 
matrix multiplication, you know, well, what happens is in order to generate a, uh, one element of each, uh, you know, one element of the uh, output array or output matrix, we're going to take one row of the, in, uh, one of the first input and one column of the second input, and we're going to do a dot product of these, the row and the column, and then generate the output element. Okay, so that's all there is. <coughs> so this goes back to the, uh, the memory layout question. Someone asked whether, you know, um, CUDA is row major, uh, major or column major. And uh, CUDA is row major in the sense that um, the rows are not going to be broken up into the uh, linear memory uh, uh, layout. As David mentioned that, you know, in the computer, you know, well, in, for those of you who are not computer science or computer engineering majors, you know, well, the DRAM used to store all the data is actually linearly addressed. Okay, so it's, you know, it's really uh, from a very small address all the way up to a very big, you know, uh, number, right? So that they're all linearly uh, placed. So whenever we declare these two-dimensional data structures or three-dimensional data structures, in the end, they're all stored into this huge linear, uh, you know, uh, storage. So in the row major um, in, uh, layout, what we do is we take the first row, we lay them out, and then we take the second row, we lay them out right after the first row, and we take the third row, and we lay them out right after the second row, and so on. So in the memory, eventually you see a, you know, a total linear um, placement of the data. So what, why, why does this matter? What mat the reason why it matters is that when we actually access a two-dimensional array, uh, what we're really doing is when we say uh, we're going to have an x um, index and then a y index, the y index is actually going to be multiplied by the width of the array and added to the x index so that we will actually jump over to the right section and then use the x index to find the element. So that's going to be how the code is going to look like in all the uh, all the examples. The reason why we don't encourage you to use the C, the, the C two-dimensional array uh, in your code is that, um, you know, as David mentioned, the implementation of the tool chain over time, you know, uh, there have been a couple bugs in history that uh, you know, people have reported and people have fixed. So in, in the various generations of the tool chain, there could be a couple situations where if you use a two-dimensional array, the casting, you know, for those of you who are computer you know, compiler experts, the, the casting is, that may not be done exactly right in some cases. So it's a little bit dangerous. So that's why when we give these examples, we give you, you know, these already linearized way of accessing so that there's no danger of you know, tripping into those bugs. But most of those bugs are probably fixed by now and the new versions of the tool chain probably take, take care of all that. But just to make sure that you don't trip accidentally on these things, we make things simple for you. And that also brings up another topic. Um, you know, uh, for those of you who trip on any kind of bug, you know, not that I'm, I'm saying that you will, but if you trip on any kind of bug, filing a bug report is a very welcome, friendly gesture. Um, you know, in, in this in this community, it's truly so. You know, a lot of the previous students didn't believe me when I mentioned this. But uh, when you file a bug report, uh, you know, you will go to get some people in media who will actually be very thankful. So you know, when you file a report, uh, bug reports, you will get very nice treatment. You know, from these engineers. So let's, let me take you through the first you know, uh, the, the exam example. Let's start with a typical case where you will have an application, and the application is totally run on the, on the uh, CPU today, right? And then uh, you want to make that thing run faster. So you know, we start with matrix multiplication with a, you know, a, a host, uh, you know, total host implementation where I can, we can imagine that um, you, you will write a uh, function where you're passing two input arrays, and then you pass the point, uh, also passing an output array where you know, the, the function is going to fill in, and then you're passing the width that specify how big these you know, arrays are, right? So uh, within the function, you're going to have a two-level loop, and each level of the loop will uh, iterate in, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, column, in the, uh, in the all, uh, across all the rows, and then the inner loop will, uh, uh, will uh, operate across, uh, let me see, i and j. Uh, i will be the y, uh, Yes, so I will be the y index and the j will be the x index. So I will go uh, down this way and then x, uh, j will go horizontally. And um, so essentially these two levels of the loop will iterate through all the elements that you need to generate for p. And for each element in the loop body, you're going to do a dot product uh, calculation. So that will take, essentially for each i and j, you will identify a row, you know, using i, a row from n and a, a column from, uh, from n, and you do a dot product and write into the element ij in the p, okay? So um, the dot product is very uh, simple. You, you know, essentially what you do is you will uh, fetch the element from n and fetch the element from n. The element from n will use the i, which is a uh, you know, row index, so you will multiply i by the width, and that gives you the beginning point of the row. Remember that memory layout thing? And then you add k, which uh, tells you how far down in that row you should be in the inner product. Same thing with the, uh, with the n. So you will, you know, you will do the, uh, the reverse because you will have how far down into the column will give you will be need, need to be multiplied by the width so that you can get to the beginning of that, uh, that row again and then use j to get to the element that you're, you're supposed to be working on. So with these two, you will be able to get the two elements and you, do, you multiply the two elements and uh, accumulate that into the sum. By the time you're done with the entire row and the entire column, you have the answer. So this will be a simple CPU code that you execute. In order to uh, execute the code on CUDA, you will need to go through a couple hoops. And um, you know, David already gave you all the tools that you need in order to, uh, to, to execute the code on the, on, the, on the GPU. So the original function needs to be rewritten. The original function no longer just go ahead and do the computation, but rather it would allocate memory under CUDA device, you will transfer data to the device, and call a kernel function that will be executed on the device. In the end, you will actually transfer data back from the device to memory. But as far as the rest of the program is concerned, all these things happen within that function that is under the hood and not visible to the rest of the code. So from the, the perspective of the outside, the rest of the code, this function took care of all the dirty work that needs to be uh, to happen in order for GPU to do the work. So you know what? So you will see, as soon as, as, soon as you enter the, or, uh, the same function name, you know what? The, uh, the CPU code will now essentially do a CUDA malloc. And MD, as you will recall, this MD is going to be on the GPU memory. So remember one thing. The, address or the pointer that you receive in the um, CUDA malloc, remember this is called from the CPU code, right? But you're getting a GPU pointer, okay? You're getting a pointer into the GPU global memory. Do not use that pointer in the CPU code. Even though it's visible to you, you really should just pass that pointer right into the CUDA main copy rather than using that pointer and mess with it in the CPU code yourself, okay? It's a very dangerous, bad habit if you do that. Yes, fine. Uh, that's a great question, David. What should I say at this point? <laughs> Am I on? Yes, okay. you are. So uh, the, the GPU, um, uh, GPUs do have support for both byte orderings, but generally they, they don't ship configured uh, that way. Uh, they're configured for 99.9% .9 of the market. <laughs> Intel ordering. That's right. Yeah. Okay, another question? Okay, 
So the question is, uh, once you, you transfer data from CPU to GPU, and um, you know, let's say the data was used by one of the kernel functions, and then you call another kernel function, can you rely on the fact that the data is still there? Yes, the data will be there. So the data in the global memory is visible to all the kernel invocations. Okay. Any other? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the question is, uh, you know, could an copy looks like a message passing, you know, from the G uh, CPU to the GPU? So uh, the question is, is the um, is, is blocking or non-blocking? You know, like, when you get to the kernel, do you know that it's already there, right? And um, John, why don't you answer this question? So basically what's going to happen is all the commands that you issue to the GPU will happen asynchronously with respect to the host, but will happen more or less synchronously on the GPU. So if you uh, kick off two memory copies and then invoke a kernel, the two memory copies will happen asynchronously with respect to the host, and the kernel invocation will happen asynchronously with respect to the host. But the kernel invocation will be held suspended until the previous memory copies complete. Uh, with the standard API calls. Does and there are sense? trickier things that you can do to get around some of this stuff and do even more complicated things. Okay. But, so that's the reason why uh, David said, if you don't worry about it, it will probably just work out. But this is a longer version of what David said. <laughs> okay, so we want this work out. <laughs> Personally, I don't know the APA, the MPI standard in and out, but I believe so, yes. That's a mm -hmm. okay. So these functions are non-blocking on the host, but there is another function that you can call that will basically ensure that all previous GPU messages, kernel limitations, memory transfers, all of that have completed. So there is a blocking function that you can call to make sure things have completed, but by default, all these functions are not blocking. Yes. Okay. On the GPU. Essentially, on yes. the GPU. Yeah. The, the comment is essentially there is a, a little command queue uh, behind the scenes to make sure that the copying and the uh, kernel execution on the GPU is properly ordered. Exactly. There's a yeah. command queue handled by the device driver, which is completely under the hood. It's in the runtime. Okay. Yep. Cool. Um, yep. You'd have to invoke a kernel to, uh, except for the problem that you can't print something to the screen from a kernel. Like if you invoke a kernel after you invoke a memory copy from the host, that kernel will is guaranteed to see the results of that memory copy before it starts executing on the GPU. Yep. Okay. Good job. Yeah, there's a streaming. You are getting ahead. You are getting ahead of us. Yeah. So the answer to your question is yes, you are getting ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do I know when the host side memory buffer is safe to change? Like, for instance, when can I overwrite? Yeah. So that's the that's what John was saying uh, at the first part. From the host side, it's not guaranteed to you know to, to to be ordered. So you will need to explicitly synchronize on the host side before you go and change your buffer. Uh, John, did I did I re rephrase your answer right? <laughs> So it's actually a little bit safer than that. I don't know the exact details of the implementation, but I do know that there would be lots of CUDA code that would break horribly if they didn't have some kind of a locking mechanism on the CPU memory that is being transferred to the GPU. So when you invoke that memory copy, it is asynchronous, but you can basically overwrite that memory right away. There's some kind of control in the queuing mechanism in the driver that will make sure that memory copy completes before the host code is actually allowed to write over that buffer. But is it a good practice to assume this? Generally, I would say so, yes. I think that might be part of the functionality of the async uh, version of mem copy. In addition to strange things going on with streams, I think that might be one of the uh, issues with the asynchronous memory copy is you remove that protection and you might be able to overwrite your CPU memory buffer. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you have seen this, uh, this sequence. The uh, reason why I asked John to answer that question is John spends you know, time with the NVIDIA product groups and making sure that we understand the latest things. So you know what? he would know some of these details much better than I. So rather than confusing you, I'd rather John give you that answer. Okay, so, uh, so we, we saw the uh, CUDA malloc and CUDA main copy of N, and then we also saw CUDA malloc and CUDA uh, N copy for N. So after that, we also want to allocate the memory on, uh, for P, because P is the product or the output array. We don't have anything to copy from the CPU to the GPU, but we need to make sure that the GPU has an already a working space reserved for, the, uh, for producing that output. So then uh, we, we expect to see the kernel invocation code. Right? So after we have transferred the data and prepared the output area, we would expect to see the kernel invocation, and we're, we're going to show you very soon. So you know where that falls into. And after the kernel code, you also should transfer the data back. So this is where the CUDA N copy of P from the device back to the CPU should happen. And after that, you will see three frees that you know, essentially free up the code from the, uh, from the GPU. So this is now the, uh, the, kernel, the kernel part. So uh, we'll, we'll first talk about how you would declare the kernel, and then we would evoke the kernel at the space of that uh, second item uh, in the previous slide. So um, the, the, this would be the kernel function. So you would expect to see underscore, underscore, global, underscore, underscore in the declaration. So this tells you that it's a kernel function. And that kernel function will take n and d, uh, p, and these are all pointers to the device global memory. Right? And these were all allocated on the CPU side, on the host side, and passed into the kernel code. Okay? And so once we get into the kernel, uh, we're, you know, we're going to you know, remember the kernel is the code that every thread is going to execute. This goes back to that SPMD, right? It's a single piece of code, but that same code is going to be executed by all the threads. So every thread is going to see exactly the same, same code. And once you go into the code, you see this float p value. And this is an auto variable in C. Right? In, the, in the traditional C implementation, what that means is it's going to create a variable on the stack, and it's, the variable is only visible to the, the current call to that function, right? and it will disappear after the function returns. In a parallel implementation, what this means is that every thread executing this code is going to have a private copy of that p-value. Okay? It's totally private to that thread. No one else is going to see it. And this declaration, auto declaration is going to get that p-value into a register in the implementation in, the, um, in most of the GPUs. So this is actually going to be a very fast access variable okay, for um, most of the GPU implementations. So each thread is going to first initialize the p-value to zero, the private copy, and then it's going to go into the, um, the, in the product code. Now you see that the, the outer two levels of the loop disappeared, the i and j. Why? Because 
every thread is going to replace one of the iterations of the i and j. So instead of using i and j, we're going to now use the thread id x and thread id y okay, to determine which row and which column we're going to be using okay, to, you know, to do the in, the in the product. So instead of using i and j to select the row of m and column of n, we're using the thread index y to select the, um, the row of m and the thread index x to select the column of n. So this shows us that we're going to use thread index y times width. This is a memory layout thing, plus k, that means how far along into the dot product that we're working on. So this gives us the element that we're, we're going to be fetching in one iteration of the dot product. So you know, conceptually, once you understand the CPU code, it's really easy to understand the GPU code, because the thread IDs essentially just replace the outer loop i and j variables. And every thread usually corresponds to an iteration somewhere in your CPU original code. And uh, you know, once we finish the, uh, the, the dot product, the pro dot product is going to be accumulated in the local, uh, in, the, in that uh, private variable. But in the end, when we come out of the dot product, we, we have the dot product in that uh, value variable. We need to find the PD um, you know, element, which is thread ID y times uh, width plus thread ID x, and we write it into the, uh, into the, um, the output. So by the time all the threads finish, the, the PD the matrix now have all the output values. Yes, uh, so the Ah, so this is language intrinsic. Okay, so this variable is a hardware, um, you know, it's a hardware variable, meaning that yeah, it's pre-initialized by the system. So when the function refers to this variable, it has to pre prepare value by the runtime system. So it is an intrinsic value. Okay. So now going back to that position, remember we save a, um, a little place for the uh, you know, for, for the kernel invocation, right? So this now we're ready to talk about the kernel invocation. And um, in this simple example, we're using we're, I only talked about thread ID. Okay, I didn't talk about block ID. So you know, to keep things simple, I have not used multiple blocks in the code. I'm only showing you the code with, you know, that used thread IDs. What that means is that we're effectively only using one block. Okay? And I'm going to talk about block using multiple blocks very soon, actually, tomorrow morning. But you know, up to this point, we're only using one block. So we're going to just say the dimension of the grid is 1, 1. That means it's a, it's a 1 in each dimension. So that means we're only using one block. Okay? And then uh, we're using a two-dimensional uh, block organization where each dimension is the width of our array. So this gives us a you know, width by width array um, you know, organization for the threads within that block. So this goes back to what David was talking about earlier. Um, we're using one thread to calculate each, uh, one element of the output. So if we have width by width output matrix, we need to generate width by width number of threads. Everyone's responsible for one element, right? So that's why we have a direct correspondence of width by width in our block dimension. So then we invoke the kernel by using the, the dim grid and the dim block, and these will tell us that we're going to be generating width by width output and uh, using width by width number of threads. And these are the regular parameters that we were going to pass into the, uh, the kernel function. So at this point, we have a complete you know, working matrix multiplication, okay? Good. So um, you know, a couple of things to you know, just kind of summarize things for you a little bit. You know, we're using one block of threads to compute the matrix, and um, each thread will load a row of matrix MD. Okay? Each thread will actually go to a row of MD and a, row, a column of ND. And this is going to become important tomorrow, so I want to make sure you remember that. Okay? And we perform one uh, multiply addition for each pair of MD and ND doing the dot product. Right? And then we can compute the off-chip memory access ratio to be 1, 1, meaning that for every pair of M and N elements, we'll do two memory accesses. Right? And then we're going to do one multiply and one add. So we have two floating point operations for the two memory accesses we do. So we're, doing, we're only doing one memory uh, floating point computation per memory access in this computation. So the ratio is one to one at this point. And the size matrix that we can process is limited by the block size. Remember David mentioned that you know, there's going to be a size limitation of the blocks. In the current CUDA specification, the block size is 512 or less. So you will not be able to process a square matrix of 16 by, uh, more than 16 by 16 dimensions. Because if you have 32 by 32, that's 1,024. That's beyond 3, uh, 512. So in this simple implementation, using only one block, we're only going to be able to process a very small matrix up to 16 by 16. Okay? So obviously, it's a limitation. So that's why first thing tomorrow morning, we're going to re remove this by using block IDs. And then they will give you, you know, essentially arbitrary size uh, 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 matrices. So this is what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. We're going to be tiling the, um, you know, tiling the, um, the output matrix and using one block to calculate only one tile of the output matrix. And then we'll use these tiles to span the entire output matrix. And that's how we can calculate, you know, compute much bigger uh, matrices. So there's some useful information on the, on the tools. We'll just quickly go over, you know, go over these tools. Um, you know, starting tomorrow afternoon, you're going to be compiling uh, CUDA programs. And um, uh, the CUDA pro these CUDA programs are going to be you know, essentially C programs that include both CPU code and the GPU code. And you're going to be using NVCC, NVDSC compiler. And this is what we call the compiler driver. It will take all the keywords that correspond to the CPU and extract all the CPU functions out of the uh, program and feed that into the host compiler. So whether it, you're using GCC for your host or using Intel ICC, the compiler driver is going to feed all those functions down to the host compiler. So then um, for all the code that is on the GPU, it's going to go down to the NVIDIA own two chain and compile that down to something called PTX, parallel thread execution uh, you know, uh, representation. And this G uh, PTX code is going to actually be executed by the runtime and you know, uh, on the GPU. So that, uh, we're showing some PT uh, PTX examples. And in fact, you can actually look at the, G uh, the PTX code um, yourself as a, almost like assembly code. Okay? Um, so this summarizes you know, what I just said. And linking-wise, you know, um, I think the linker command that you're going to be using in the lab is you know, all pretty much prepared for you in the make file. But uh, you know, just as a reminder, I always tell people, remember, you need to have two libraries. One is the CUDA runtime library. One is the core library. One has to do with these runtime data transfer kind of things. The other one has to do with like, arithmetic functions and so on. You need to both have both. But this is not, nothing special if you, uh, you know, are familiar with most of the C implementations. Debugging. This is going to be important. Okay? Uh, if you compile the, uh, the program using device emulation mode, okay, minus device in, uh, emu, then uh, it runs completely on the host using uh, you know, the CUDA runtime. So the, you, in this emulation mode, all the CUDA threats are going to be run as CPU threats okay, very slowly, okay, but they will run correctly. 
And there's no need for any device or CUDA driver on the machine. So if you just want to kind of play with CUDA code, you know, and don't care about performance, you can just use emulation mode to run a CUDA program. And each, uh, so, but running this emulation mode gives you some advantages in, in, uh, you know, in debugging. So for example, you, use, you can use the host native debugger support. So anything that you, you typically use on your host, like GDB and you know, uh, breakpoints and inspection, all these things, you can use them. And the second one is you can access any device specific data from the host code and vice versa, which is not kosher if you use real GPU. Okay? This is only for you to debug the code. So if you run it in emulation mode, you can actually print you know, the, the, the device data from the CPU code. It, it, it works. But you have to remember, if you did that on a GPU execution, chances are you're going to have a core dump. Okay, be very careful with that. Yes. Yeah. It, yes, yeah. So exactly. And I've seen people doing that, that kind of support. It, you know, it's very convenient in that sense. And another interesting thing is, you know what, printf is a f very useful function for most of this. You know, my grad students are much better than I. You know, when I debug my program, I use printf. Okay? And then most of my grad students just, just look at me strange when, when they see my printf code. So, but if you execute a function on the GPU, you cannot call printf from that function. So, but if you want to debug using printf, you can you execute that function in emulation mode, and you can use printf. Just make sure that you remove that printf before you recompile it for the GPU. Okay? And you can detect you know, deadlock situations by improper use of sync threads, you know, by stepping through things and then making sure that all the threads have arrived at the synchronization point, which we have not talked about. So we're going to talk about sync threads tomorrow. There's some pitfalls you have to remember. The emulation the device threads execute sequentially, so the exact execution order of, you know, of these threads may be different from what they will do on the, um, you know, in, on the GPU. So if your result is execution order dependent for some reason, it's not going to necessarily catch all the bugs. Okay, be careful with that. And the second one is, you know, if you de de reference device pointer in the CPU code, when you do emulation, it will work. It will work properly. But if you de try to de reference a device pointer in the real GPU execution mode, it will core down. You know, it will, the program will likely crash. Floating point. The result of floating point computation will be slightly different because when you run emulation mode, it's using the, the CPU's floating point, and sometimes the double precision features may creep in through very subtle ways. So you, you may slightly change the, the precision of your computation. So be aware of it. And that's pretty much the, uh, it for the um, for, for the cool introduction. And we should uh, transition into the um, in, into the uh, multidisciplinary panel right away. If you have any more questions, you know, I will be around for the reception afterwards. So you know, make sure you catch me or David or the TAs for more questions. Okay. So let's all go to the multidisciplinary panel right away. Okay.